Here's the way I look at it, folks, and I think the silver lining here might be an incredible boon for the country. It's almost like some sort of a weird Buddhist parable, though. I mean, you know, sometimes opportunities for change come in the strangest sort of disguise, you know, like national bankruptcy. If you can't afford stuff that we probably shouldn't be doing because it's probably bad for us, but it's impossible to give up and you have to give it up through no choice of your own, might that not be a positive thing? You know, here, let me explain this. And again, take this with a grain of salt, okay? Because I had to write a paper about this in middle school and I got a C- minus by the skin of my teeth on this subject, so I may not know what I'm talking about. But this reminds me so much of like a poison crown. You know, the Second World War happens and the United States is sort of crowned with global leadership or leadership of the free world is what we called it at the time, right, to sort of highlight this... Um, giant war of humanity between the free world and the non-free world. And the crown seems like this wonderful thing. The United States has been granted what a lot of people at the time said, well, we deserve it. You know, this is what you get for being liberty and the champion of the freedom of the humanity, blah, 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 blah. Okay, well, the crown's poisoned. The paper I got a C- minus on by the skin of my teeth in middle school was about the Lord of the Rings, J.R.R. Tolkien's classic, right? And the reason I got the C- minus was apparently I didn't get any of the sub-themes right or understand the themes. But when I look at it now, the whole theme of the ring is the, and you know, people are going to listen to me and go, Dan, you're an idiot. That's the main theme and you never got it. But the whole theme of the, of the ring of power being something that seems like this unbelievable gift. How did this fall? How, we are so graciously lucky that this fell into our hands and maybe even we secretly deserved it. And... Forget about, you know, any bad that's been done in the past with any power like this. We're going to use this power for good. And then it turns a good, upstanding, admirable hobbit into something that's a, you know, caricature of what it used to be. A negative caricature. I'm not saying the United States is Gollum at the moment. I'm just suggesting it's a lot more Gollumish than it used to be. And I think that the ring of power, so to speak, the global hegemony, is the reason for this. And that our inability to afford all of this now may be the only logical way you can break an addiction to, you know, the military-industrial complex and all the things it does for us. I mean, people on my board were saying, you'd be, you'd be really sorry if it went away. You think you're hemorrhaging jobs now, you know, do away with, uh, you know, Raytheon and those people and you'll be sorry. I'll tell you what, though, folks, do you think, and I could be wrong about this, too, do you think Americans, if you told them that the reason we have to keep the kind of foreign policy we have now, the reason we have to intervene in all these countries in the world, the reason we have to send our soldiers to fight and die and have long-term problems in these conflicts is because if we don't, our economy won't be good? We all might pay more at the pump. Your taxes might be higher. Your life might not be as prosperous if we don't go to other countries and violently you know, deal with people there. Now, I could be wrong, but I don't think Americans are going to listen to that and go, you know what, you're right. We're more like the ancient Assyrians, and we're going to involve ourselves in the world because wars can be made to pay if they're fought correctly. And spending on weapons that kill people are great for our economy, so we're all in. I think there's a contingent of Americans that might go for that. But here's how you know it wouldn't play all that well in the heartland, because, folks... If it would, we'd sell it that way. We wouldn't be talking about, well, we're going to overthrow a murderous dictator and weapons of mass destruction and all this. We'd say, hey, we need to go into Iran or your taxes are going to go up. On second thought, if that was the argument openly, I might be even more afraid for the Iranian people. That might be a tough decision for some people. I guess <laughs> just see Fox News. Fox News poll shows 80 percent of Fox News listeners would rather bomb Iran than see their taxes go up. I don't know. Just guessing. I think, ladies and gentlemen, that these sorts of financial perfect storms that are hitting the United States or about to hit the United States or will hit the United States soon or whatever provide opportunities, opportunities that would not otherwise be there if we had to depend on our you know, political system to deliver them. And the opportunities aren't just in things like, you know, global world preeminence and leadership and all that. The fact that, you know, nationally speaking, our wallet is going to be lighter than normal, is going to, I hope, provide a little chance to rebalance our portfolio in a number of different ways. You know, when your budget shrinks, 
You tend to look a little bit more harshly, you know, at what you need to keep and what you can do away with and where there's just too much inefficiency and waste to put up with stuff anymore. A perfect example is something that Samuelson talks about in this article a lot, Medicare and Medicaid. These are what pass for, you know, government health care here in the United States. Horribly expensive, terrible growth rates, and something that in any other industrialized country in the world they would look at and laugh, and maybe they do. Both of those programs, along with veteran affairs, um, health care, and all that stuff, should be part of one system. We spend more on health care in this country than any place else by a long shot, and we don't get anywhere near the value for it. That's something you can get away with when times are flush. When all of a sudden we're looking for efficiency wherever we can get it, the way the system is now seems horribly inefficient. And while you may get people who say we need to cut back on Medicare and Medicaid because we can't afford it anymore, if you don't somehow put something in to do the job that they're doing, it ain't going to do anything. You're going to have people in the emergency rooms and then you're going to have a conversation about, well, can we let's pass a law that says we can turn people away from emergency rooms and throw them out on the street, which from what I understand happens somewhere anyway. I mean, eventually you're going to hit a point where people go, we're not going to throw people out to die on the street if they don't have the proper medical insurance and less and less people have the medical insurance and blah, blah. Folks, I guess what I'm saying is we can have these. We have the luxury of having these sort of debates now. That luxury is ending because kicking the can down the road is a failed strategy now that the road is ending. And the fact that the road is ending looks like a terrible thing. If keeping things like that ring of power are absolutely you know, vitally important to you. And of course, ask Gollum about that. He didn't want to give up the ring of power and neither do we. But of course, anybody reading the story from a third person perspective, not in the, you know, position of a Gollum can see, hey, wait a minute, the best thing that creature could do is throw that ring in the nearest river, get it far away from it as possible. It's killing him. He can't see it. But he's not supposed to, folks. There's a great interview that was conducted, um, during the Nuremberg War Trials with, um, you know, very high-level member of Hitler's government, Hermann Göring. And Göring had this interview with a U.S. intelligence operative who was also a psychologist um, while awaiting the verdict in the trial. And Göring was explaining, you know, this dichotomy that we talked about at the very beginning, this dichotomy between, you know, what's good for the country on the history book level stage, you know, being the colossus astride the world, militarily speaking, and the interest of the average person on the ground. And let's be honest, a lot of the people who have to actually go fight and die and suffer to make that history book, you know, story for the future. And here's how the conversation goes down between Goring and this interviewer while he's awaiting his verdict and eventually to be hanged and he'll commit suicide instead. Here's the conversation. This is in the voice of the interviewer writing, quote, We got around to the subject of war again, and I said that contrary to his attitude, you know, Goring's attitude, I did not think that the common people are very thankful for leaders who bring them war and destruction. Goring answers the interviewer. Why, of course, the people don't want war, Goring shrugged. Why would some poor slob on a farm want to risk his life in a war when the best that he can get out of it is to come back to his farm in one piece? Naturally, the common people don't want war, neither in Russia, nor in England, nor in America, nor for that matter in Germany. That is understood. But after all, it is the leaders of the country who determine the policy, and it is always a simple matter to drag the people along, whether it is a democracy or a fascist dictatorship or a parliament or a communist dictatorship. Then the interviewer replies. There's one difference, I pointed out. In a democracy, the people have some say in the matter through their elected representatives. And in the United States, only Congress can declare wars. Goring responds. Oh, that is all well and good. But voice or no voice, the people can always be brought to the bidding of the leaders. That is easy. All you have to do is tell them they're being attacked and denounce the pacifists for lack of patriotism and exposing the country to danger. It works the same way in any country. End quote. That conversation, in a nutshell, to me, sums up the difference, the dichotomy between the interest of the nation state at the grand history book level and the interest of the people who collectively make up that nation state. What do you get as a taxpayer 
for the United States' global policemen of the world policy? What's in it for you? And if the argument is, well, you know, you help keep the defense industry alive and the defense industry helps this country, that almost sounds like socialism. If that was any other industry besides the defense industry, most people who support the idea I just gave you wouldn't support the idea at all. If you were talking health care instead of the military, that is all of a sudden, you know, rank socialism. Now, I understand defense has always been a job of the government. But as we've said in many other shows, there's no logical line defining a prudent level of defense from a crazy, you know, overspending level of defense because someone can always say, listen, we're vulnerable. You're crazy. Do you want to weaken the nation? I mean, Goring just gave you all the talking points right there in 1946. Our country is about as enthusiastic of giving up its global position of power, its ring of power, as were all the other superpowers before it. You just don't tend to find superpowers who are eager to hand the ring off to somebody else. But who does a country exist for? Does it exist for the history books or the leaders or the 1% of people who maybe make a killing, pardon the pun, on um, you know all of this global foreign policy? Or does it belong to the average people that Goring was talking about, the poor slob on a farm who, at best, will get out of the war, the chance to come back to his farm? Who does the country exist for? And in an era of incredibly shrinking dollars and no ability now to postpone decisions that should have been you know, handled when the problems were much smaller decades ago, we're going to have to make some tough choices. I think the fact that we're going to have to make some tough choices, even though it's tough times that mandate that we're going to have to make tough choices, is an improvement on not making tough choices at all. We may have to throw the ring of power away now, folks. Sounds like a horrible waste, doesn't it? Might be all kinds of unicorns and rainbows, though, on the other side. At least that's what my mom thinks.